Well, good morning. Thank you for your patience there. It was always going to be the way, wasn't it? Last week went so smoothly, and um, today it hasn't. <laughs> it's great to see you all, and uh, welcome once more to our, our service. John, are you going to come and do some announcements for us? Yeah. Please, yeah. Beryl Naden's funeral is on Friday uh, this coming week at, at one o'clock in this hall. Um, if you can join at that time, that would be good. Uh, it's lovely to see Wendy with us. Hello, Wendy. Um, uh, and we, we announced uh, uh, John's uh, passing uh, uh, last week. Funeral is on Thursday the 12th of August, uh, and that's at Rawdon Crematorium at 1.45, and Majors Andrew and Val Spivey will be uh, carrying out that service, leading that service. Um, the charity shop needs uh, some volunteers, if you're able to do that, and we're also in need of a, a people to go on a rota for coffee uh, here after the Sunday morning worship, so if you think you can do that um, at any point, then please either see Joy or Cheryl when she's here. Um, Sophie's not well, Sophie's got COVID, so if you'd like to remember uh, Sophie and the, and the family in, in prayer, please, at this time. There is a prayer meeting uh, next Sunday morning at quarter to uh, 10. And um, it, Gordon's not here, is he, this morning? Gordon Pullion. Gordon's 90 next Friday. Um, so if you have the opportunity to um, text him and make sure he remembers that it's his birthday next Friday, uh, please do. And uh, that's, that's the announcement for this morning. Thank you very much. You are greater than our minds can fathom, able to achieve things beyond our imagination, working in ways that defy all our expectations. Forgive us that so often, often in our lives we lose sight of who you are and all you can do. We see things from a human rather than divine perspective, allowing our thoughts to be tied down to earth rather than so up to heaven, failing to grasp the opportunities you offer us because we forget that what is impossible for us is possible for you. 
forgive us for allowing what can still be to become what might have been. Too often we have been guilty of feeble faith, narrow horizons and negative thinking. Help us to recognize all you who do in our lives, to be awake to the possibilities open to us, to have faith, attempt and expect great things even though they seem beyond us. I couldn't help but uh, smile halfway through that meditation. Um, Are we still recording today? (laughs) Good luck with the editing. (laughs) That's going to be fun, isn't it? It's lovely to see new faces this week, uh, people that are back for the first time. So I can see Rishama. Lovely to see you and your lovely family behind you. I think that's all of them, isn't it, there? And and Freddie as well down here. And I saw Graham somewhere. Where's Graham gone to? Oh, he's at the back there. Graham, <laughs> I was looking for you up the top first of all. Lovely to see you, Graham. And anybody else back for the first time? Dom and Derek and Joel and Phil and Wendy and anybody else? Lovely to see you. That's a good number, isn't it? Lovely to have you two with us as well. Um, you're welcome to take the sheets back, but don't tell them how it's gone. <laughs> Lovely to have Becky's mum and dad, isn't it, uh, with us today. Okay, uh, John, I think we may have the sound for the songster. But, so if you want to introduce what it is, we'll have a go at playing it.
going to share in Daniel chapter 9. Um, we've been going through the book of Daniel over the last uh, couple of months, and we hit this prayer of Daniel's, Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read it from um, verse 4 onwards, because Daniel has realized that according to Jeremiah, the 70 years of exile that he prophesied are just about coming to fulfillment. And in sackcloth and ashes, Daniel prayed to the Lord, his God, and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our king, our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we've sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. Yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. O oh Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our oh God, hear the prayers and petition of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. We're going to have a look at that in just a short while.
I don't know if you're aware, but the pandemic, which has afflicted us, has lasted for uh, uh, just about 70 weeks. Now, I know that because each week as we serve the homeless and the needy of Leeds, Joy records the figures and she tells us which week it is. We're tentatively now, aren't we, making steps towards a return to a life that is more the norm than we are used to. But can you imagine being exiled from your home, not for 70 weeks, but for 70 years? Not by choice, but by oppressive circumstances, by cruel regimes that would not allow you to return home, by dictators who kept you in slavery. In Daniel chapter 9, we discover that Daniel recalls the promises made through the prophet Jeremiah that the Jewish exile would last for 70 years. Daniel, therefore, is now an old man. And as he remembers the promise, so he realizes that those years are almost up. And so he returns and he turns to the Lord in prayer. And in this prayer that we read earlier, we find four basic prayer principles that we should try to build into our own lives of prayer. And if you do this, it would enhance and increase and and make your prayer life so much better. Make no mistake, you see, Daniel was one of the great people of prayer of the Bible. Praying to the Lord three times a day was what got him into trouble with the emperor and consequently thrown into the lion's den. And here in chapter 9, we find this amazing prayer beseeching God to remember his promises and restore the Jewish nation to Jerusalem. And as we look at this prayer, the four principles that we can incorporate into our prayer are these. First of all, we learn that Daniel, his prayer was a prayer for forgiveness. The second thing, his prayer was a prayer to a righteous God. The third thing, his his prayer covered his immediate concerns. And then last of all, his prayer was a prayer of trust in God to act on the promises he had given. And if you look carefully at these four parts of his prayer, you will discover that all four of them come up in the Lord's prayer. And we'll come back to that as we go through uh, our headings this morning. So first of all, in prayer, we recognize our sin. Daniel prayed, we have sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked and have rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and laws. We've not listened to your servants, the prophets. Daniel here is expressing a deep repentant sorrow for his sin his own sin, but also the sin of the nation. And if you look carefully at this prayer, Daniel even brings to God the things in which he had played no part personally, but belonged to him because he is part of fallen humanity. Sometimes, perhaps often, we fail to recognize our own part in the fall of humanity and the terrible things that happen in this world because of that original sin. Do we recognize our own part in the evils that are in our world today, even though we might not be guilty of any of them ourselves? But because we are part of fallen humanity, we are part of the whole complex uh, nature of sin. As we come to the Lord in prayer... We need to recognize that we are not coming to the Lord as holy and righteous people. We are coming as sinners in need of forgiveness. One of my friends in his prayers would always liken himself to a dirty rag in need of cleansing. And in Isaiah chapter 1, 16 and 17, it says, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. You see, we need to recognize that when we come to the Lord in prayer, that we are human beings who often get things wrong, that we stuff up, that we screw things up, that we make mistakes, that our judgments aren't always just, and that we fall short of the mark that God sets before us, namely, that we sin. And so we pray, as in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our transgressions. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sin. Oh Lord, forgive. 
All those things that we should not have said. All those things we should not have done. All those things that we should not have thought. Oh Lord, forgive. All those things that we failed to do. Failed to say. Failed to think. Oh Lord, forgive all our sinfulness. Our falling short of God's holy standard. And you know, it's not just the big sins, because in God's sight, there's no such thing as a big sin and a little sin. I believe that that was an invention of the Catholic Church in order to create indulgences for cash. But to God, sin is sin. And he has a zero tolerance policy towards it. The wonderful thing that we learn is that God is a God whose very nature is one of forgiveness. Even if we have sinned, in the worst imaginable ways. The mercy of God is so vast that he will forgive us time and time again. Daniel knew this. He had utter confidence that the results of his prayers would be forgiveness, not because of his mercy, sorry, not because of his praying, but because of God's grace, because of God's mercy. As Isaiah 1 goes on to say, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. When we come to God in prayer, we need to recognize who we are. But we also need to recognize the righteousness of God. For Daniel prayed, the Lord, the great and awesome God, Lord, you are righteous. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. The Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. One of the most important principles of prayer is that we've got to remember to whom we are praying. Who is our Lord and our God? What image of him do I have in my mind when I come to him in prayer? Do I see him as a superman, a Santa Claus? Or is he an alien in a UFO or a judge upon the throne? When we bow before God, it's of utmost importance to spend time considering him and our relationship with him or her, if that is your image of God. Jesus Jesus taught us this principle in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right at the very start, the principle that he's introducing in that Lord's Prayer is, who are you praying to? To whom? Are your prayers directed? I had the privilege back in 1995 of hearing a great man of prayer teach those who were gathered into his secret of how he prayed. The Reverend David Yongi Cho headed up the largest church in the world at that time in Seoul in South Korea. And at that point, 1995, it was huge. They reckoned it was something like a million members But it started from a group of six people meeting on a rubbish tip outside that city in 1958 and praying together. His first point of prayer, something he spent more time on than any other, he told us, was recognizing God's character and their relationship. And so he would look at the I am sayings of Jesus and compare them to how he fitted into that picture. If Jesus was the true vine, then he was a dependent branch. If Jesus was the way, then he was the one who was lost. If Jesus was the resurrection and the life, then he was the one suffocated by death in need of new life. So let me ask you, when you come to God in prayer, to whom are you praying? The third thing that Daniel uh, showed in his prayer was that we recognize our needs. For Daniel prayed, Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. On a Wednesday night, Rosa Topley has been leading an online prayer meeting in which we've joined together to pray for people in need. On a Sunday morning, we've restarted our prayer meetings and most of those prayers are again prayers of intercession and petition, bringing to the Lord our needs. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong at all. In fact, we are urged to do it. It's patterning ourselves on Jesus. For in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions 
with fervent cries and tears. Just after Jesus gives to us the Lord's Prayer in Luke's account, Jesus goes on to say, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? I had a conversation with someone in a health centre waiting room. And uh, somebody I know, not just a stranger. And we were talking about how your role as a parent changes as your children get older. And those of you who are parents will understand when I say that we talked about how in the early years it's all nappies and bottles and burping. And then uh, that develops into being the fount of all knowledge as they bring you their homework to be in the cook, the cleaner, the cash machine, the taxi driver and so on. And it's good that when your children have begun to grow up and enter adulthood that they still come to you with their needs, knowing that you would do all that you possibly can to help to meet that need. We're fortunate in that we don't live too far from our children. Two of them, as you know, live in Leeds, and the third is in Manchester, and we have five grandchildren. But every so often, we get a phone call from one of those children, Mum, it's usually Mum, can you pick up the children from school? Can you take them to? Could you possibly babysit? And so on. You, if you are a good parent, will do all that you possibly can to meet the needs of your children, no matter how old they are. Is that right? So why do we think that God will do anything less? Of course he won't. We are his children. The message version of Philippians 4 and verse 6 says, Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So bring your needs to God. And here's the fourth thing. In prayer, we have to recognize that God hears our prayers and he acts. Daniel prayed, uh, for your sake, O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Lord, listen, Lord, forgive, Lord, hear and act. His final plea was for the Lord to listen to his prayer and to act upon it. When we pray, we pray with a confidence that God not only hears, but he listens and he acts upon our prayers. Now, that might not always be in the way in which we hope or expect, because our God is not a Santa Claus in heaven, checking our prayer list once, perhaps twice, to see if we've been naughty or nice. He's the Lord omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is the Lord omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is the Lord omnipresent. He is the Lord ever-present. Yet more than this, he is our loving Heavenly Father who cares for us intimately. So we can come to him with confidence that he will hear our prayer and act as is his want. And that's the difficult thing for us as humanity to understand. But if we don't come with confidence that he will hear and act, then why are we praying? We might as well go and hug a tree and offer our prayers to the tree or pray to some pieces of stone set out in a particular geometric fashion or worship Mickey Mouse for that matter. Officership in our early days was a lot different to officership today. Finances were especially difficult and when we were at Boston it was especially hard. And it was one Christmas, we've told you this before, it was one Christmas, it was so tough And we didn't know where the money was coming from. And Joy was really, really concerned. And so I said to her, you know, how long have we known God? How long have we served him? And she said, the number of years. And I said, has he ever let us down? And she said, no. I said, why do you think he's going to let us down now? And we can witness that money just poured in that Christmas for us. Boston Corps used to sing a song which included the words, Never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Jesus will not fail you. Be sure of that. Trust your Father in heaven to provide for you as you come to him with your needs because God knows your needs. 
and he does indeed act upon your prayer requests. But above that, God is a God who steps into our humanity and he takes action. Some hundred of years after Daniel, God acted in a wonderful and unique way to answers, answer Daniel's prayer as he stepped into humanity's history and took human flesh to live and die among us for our forgiveness. So when we bring to him our needs, we discover, as Paul writes in Romans 8.32, as the message version puts it, if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? I think that one of the long-term outcomes of the pandemic we're still going through is a loss of confidence. Many don't even trust themselves to go shopping let alone return to church. Many have seen the hospitals overrun, the difficulty in getting a face-to-face -face doctor's appointment, schools sending their children home again and again. The banks, the workplaces, businesses have closed or have become severely restricted in the hours that they've been open. Our government have asked of us one thing, but have behaved in, in their personal lives in a contrary fashion. And the opposition have been unable or willing to come up with any viable alternative plans. Our confidence in what have been the pillars of our society have been shaken to the core. As we approach these months of return then, we can learn from Daniel's prayer to lead us from this chaos around us to a renewed character in the image of Jesus Christ. And so we confess our sin. We focus our attention on the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. We bring to Him our needs, our petitions, our prayers. And we place our trust in Him. Tony Horsfall in his book Rhythms of Grace says that we need to return to the practice of sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he says that to do that, we've got to stop, to sit, and to listen. I think that that is essential over the coming month as our, as our spiritual persona, our souls are healed and we learn once again to trust our Lord as we bring to him in that still quietness our prayers. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God bless you.